Hi, my name is Jake Bosenkemper, Director of Agronomy and Research here at Liquorgrow. Welcome to our Lead Academy session. Today we're going to talk about some new ethanol policy, some, some new tax incentives that are going to be coming down through the ethanol industry that may in fact impact your farming operation. And to help walk us through that, we have Devin Mogler with us. Devin is the Senior Vice President of Corporate, and, uh, Corporate Relations with Green Plains. Um, Devin, why don't you give us a little bit of background on yourself, just a little bit. Sure thing. So I grew up on a fourth generation family farm in northwest Iowa. Family still farms there, raise corn and soybeans, fair to finish hogs, and also feed out cattle. Uh, I went to undergraduate at Iowa State University for ag business and economics with Katie Hess, uh, who's my connection here, and then went to work for the co-op system in Iowa for about seven years before I took a 180 in my career and ended up in Washington, D.C., working in the U.S. Senate on policy. Did that for a few years and then started working for Green Plains, which is a leading ethanol producer. We have 10 ethanol plants, make just shy of a billion gallons per year. And I focus on policy uh, and, and government relations as well as investor relations and uh, public relations and marketing. Well, thanks, Devin. Devin, I work with Katie Hess every day and I feel bad for you if she's your end. <laughs> All right, no, Katie's, Katie's great colleagues, everybody knows. So, what is the 45Z tax credit that's going to be coming to the ethanol industry? And what does that mean for farmers? Could you give us some background on that? Sure thing. So, so maybe a little bit of history. When the ethanol industry was first really getting going in the U.S. about 20 years ago when the renewable fuel standard was created, there was a blender's tax credit that was uh, an additional incentive in, additional, in addition to the, the mandate. That went away about 12 years ago. So. While a lot of people think that ethanol is subsidized, it hasn't actually received a tax credit for over a decade. Biodiesel and renewable diesel have continued to receive a blender's tax credit of about a dollar per gallon on an on and off basis over the, the past, uh, that same time frame. But with this new bill that was passed in 2022, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act, which was a politically expedient title, it had a lot of clean energy provisions, a lot of them geared toward electric vehicles, clean hydrogen, et cetera, but importantly, it included an, a new tax credit which was designed to be technology neutral for all liquid fuels. So the idea is it would roll in that dollar per gallon biodiesel tax credit, the renewable diesel tax credit, as well as new sustainable aviation fuel tax credits into one tax policy that would treat a gallon of fuel the same across whatever the feedstock was based on the carbon intensity of that fuel. And what's important here is if you can reduce the carbon intensity of the ethanol you make, whether it's from the corn and the practices on farm, or from carbon capture at the ethanol production facility, or anything throughout the supply chain, all of that directly ties into the value of that underlying tax credit. This, so this is very new. It starts in 2025. Currently, it is enacted to run through 2027, though as we've seen with the biodiesel tax credit, it's very likely that this credit will be extended in perpetuity. So Devin, my general understanding of this tax credit is the, the ethanol industry is going to be incentivized to lower their carbon footprint, right? And because roughly half of the, of the carbon through the supply chain is the production of the crop, farmers are going to be incentivized to do things to lower their greenhouse gas footprint. And that could be things like growing cover crops, that could be reducing tillage, that could be using less fertilizer, uh, that could be being more, more efficient with diesel fuel. Those are some examples of things a farmer could do to lower their carbon footprint. But the question I have for you is, you know, what are the range and incentives you might see from these different practices? Sure thing. So the overall credit can go up to $1 per gallon of fuel. Now, easy math, a bushel of corn makes about three gallons of ethanol. So let's think about it in those terms. If you have an upside of a dollar per gallon, that's an upside of three dollars per bushel. That's the ultimate end of the range. Now, 
you have to be under a certain carbon intensity threshold in order to qualify, but once the ethanol producer gets under that, every point of CI is two cents per gallon to the producer or six cents of value to be shared with the, the producer, the crop producer and everyone else in the value chain. So it all comes down to the, the math behind it and, and the devil's always in the details with these programs, particularly when you're dealing with the IRS. Uh, but so they're still developing the, the details of the model behind this. We're still waiting to see some regulations come out. They haven't actually proposed any regulations around this, even though the law was passed almost 18 months ago. But we're, the biggest thing to look at is the update to what's called the Argon GREET model. And it's just an acronym for this model developed by the Department of Energy that tracks the life cycle of all of these fuels, everything from petroleum to biodiesel to ethanol, sustainable aviation fuel, et cetera, and how they are able to assign values to cover crops, for example, which could be as much as, say, eight or nine points. Remember, that's suddenly 16 to 18 cents per gallon or times three on a per bushel basis. Now, like the biodiesel tax credit, where you've got a dollar per gallon to play with, that gets spread through the supply chain. Some of that goes to the, the petroleum refiner who's blending the product in. Some of it goes to the end consumer when they're putting it in their vehicle as an incentive. But some of it gets passed down to the farmer because if I, as an ethanol producer, am able to uh, get more value for my product, I'm gonna be willing to bid a little more for corn. And I think you know if we fast forward maybe five or 10 years, I think when you look, when you call your a uh, grain elevator or a processing facility, they're gonna have a bid posted, they're gonna have a basis, and they're also gonna have a carbon score associated with every bushel of grain. Yeah, that's great. So I have recognized, I've been, a colleague of mine and I have been playing with this Greek model and trying to understand, you know, you know, how much value could be extracted from going from full width tillage to strip tillage, for example, or growing a cover crop versus not growing a cover crop. Or, or implementing different nutrient management strategies. And there's still a lot of unanswered questions in the GREET yep. model, yep. so that would align with what you've seen too. Absolutely, and we, we've seen that model be bifurcated. California, for their low carbon fuel standard, they use their own version of the GREET model because they've got a political angle they take. They put their thumb on the scale a little bit, and we're actually seeing that out of DC now as well with the new model they're rolling out for sustainable aviation fuel. They said, oh, hey, we need to tweak this a little because we want our our political outcomes we want to see. So I think that model is going to continue to grow and evolve, may not always be grounded completely in science, but at the end of the day, I think there's going to be a, a place to play here. This administration anyway recognizes that there is, that agriculture can be part of the solution to climate change. They recognize the potential for carbon to be stored in the soil and the importance of these smart agronomic practices. So I think that's why ultimately we're going to be able to uh, to, to see some great upside from this. Yeah, and so I think, you know, if, if I were a liquor group customer, I'd be really excited because I'm doing a lot of the agronomic research to understand, you know, how do you introduce cover crops into your corn production system, maintain, if not increase yields, because this is based on a per bushel basis, yep. this, this credit will be, so yield is still gonna be important, right? So, you know, just know that I'm looking at a lot of these agronomic management practices trying to help you understand how much is your production going to be impacted by implementing, implementing XYZ practice to lower your carbon intensity scores? So I think it's going to be great. Yeah. And, and that yield point you make is very important. I mean, when you're looking at overall carbon impact divided by bushels, bushels that, that denominator becomes very important yeah. uh, when you're calculating the ultimate CI score. Absolutely. What, one, one point I do want to make is, and this is an important one, from a family farm, what I hear a lot is I don't want policies that don't give me credit for things I've already been doing. If I've already been a good actor and I've been doing cover crops and not getting compensated for it, I don't want to be penalized. And that's the beauty of this carrot approach with this tax credit is you're not penalized for what you've done in the past. Yeah. It's everything on a go forward yes, basis. That's been my understanding. Yes. yes. That's, and that's great. Yes. Devin, one thing that we heard a lot about today um, is the importance of sustainable aviation fuel to the tax credit, to this industry. Can you tell us a little bit more about how sustainable aviation fuel is gonna fit into the ethanol market going forward? Sure, so let's take a step back and think about the ethanol market as it exists today in the US. We've got about 17 billion gallons of capacity, but we only blend about 14 billion gallons into our surface transportation fuel supply. That's because our infrastructure is only set up to 
do 10% ethanol. The petroleum refiners own and control the retail system. They don't want to give away any more of the market share, any more of the gas tank than they already have. So we're kind of capped. Now we export about 1.4, 1.5 billion gallons, but that still leaves us with excess capacity and has led to some of the lower margins in the ethanol industry over the last half of a decade. The beauty of sustainable aviation fuel, it's very similar to renewable diesel. It's a drop-in fuel. You can use it in the existing engines, in the existing planes. You can push it through the existing pipelines and tank infrastructure. So the, it, it eliminates a lot of those, what have been called like blend wall challenges that ethanol has historically faced. Now, most of the sustainable aviation fuel, in fact, almost all of it today comes from HEFA feedstocks, the, the veg oils, you know, whether it's soybean oil, canola, uh, or used cooking oil, animal tallows, fats and greases. That's where the vast majority is coming from. But there is technology that is being scaled up today. It's not quite to commercial scale, uh, but to take the C2 ethanol molecule and build it up to a, a sustainable aviation fuel so it can be a drop in. And just to give you a sense of the size of the market, I mentioned you know, 14 billion gallons is what we use in surface transportation today. Just in the US for aviation fuel, it's over 20 billion. Now I was gonna ask you that question. So the potential is ginormous, even relative to today. It's massive. It's, so does that mean there'll be new ethanol plants come online potentially? There are a couple hurdles. Regulatory, technology um, are the, being the two biggest ones. But if corn ethanol can get past those two, there is absolutely going to be an ethanol plant building boom similar to what we saw when the RFS was passed and then expanded in 2005 and 2007. As a farmer, you know, well, you know, I'm not a farmer, but for our customers, this is all very comforting for me to hear because, you know, there's a lot of talk of electric vehicles, you know, the electric economy, you know, maybe the demand for ethanol going down, yeah. but it seems like if sustainable aviation fuel does come online, if some of these technologies that are close to being developed do get developed, we could be producing more ethanol for jet fuel than we ever have, right? Exactly. That's exciting. Yeah. So one other piece of that math equation is it takes about 1.7 gallons of ethanol to make one gallon of sustainable aviation fuel. So again, easy math, 17 billion gallons of production capacity in the U.S. today. That's 10 billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel, less than half of just the U.S. market, to say nothing of international. Now, international airlines have also made commitments to decarbonizing, as have our domestic carriers. So it, it is almost unlimited, the demand here. You could have every vehicle on the road switch to an EV in that same time frame, and we would still need to build additional ethanol capacity. And importantly, the facilities beside them that are turning that ethanol into sustainable aviation fuel. So I take it that since it's sustainable aviation fuel, there's going to be some regulations on how the corn was grown to, to produce this fuel. Is that correct? Yeah, so it's going to be, it has to at least hit a 50% GHG, greenhouse gas uh, reduction, versus petroleum jet A. But it's going to be that same technology neutral tax credit, the 45Z. Sustainable aviation fuel is going to fall under there. And get this, it has an even bigger credit. Rather than two cents per gallon, like you would get for ethanol, it's going to get three and a half cents per gallon. So all the incentives are just dialed up. And some states are now implementing uh, state level incentives for sustainable aviation fuel. The state of Illinois has done this. You can stack that as w along with RFS uh, RINs to provide additional market pulls. Well, Devin, this is all great news for me because uh, you know I'm in the business of growing corn uh, more efficiently, more environmentally sustainable. You know, I know our customers are up for the challenge, so it's going to be an exciting future. Yeah, I'm, I'm very excited about it as well. It's not going to be without its challenges. I mean, there, there, are, there are people who view corn ethanol, who view soybean production, who view modern agriculture as not sustainable. So we've got a, we've got a lot of work to tell that story about the potential that we have to be part of the climate solution, uh, to tell our story about how we've become more productive uh, over the past few decades, even without some of these incentives. I mean, I remember 20 years ago, uh, growing up on the farm and we weren't doing cover crops. We were turning the soil black every fall. 
Um, and we're not doing that anymore. We're, we're using cover crops, we're doing conservation tillage, and that's even before we really really have monetary incentives to do it because it's the right thing to do. Sure, sure. But it's about time farmers start getting compensated for doing yes, the right thing. Absolutely. All right, Devin. So you know, as these tax incentives continue to roll out, and we you know we get focused on exactly how this is going to get implemented. At this at the current time, what would you do if you were a farmer and you were interested in getting involved in these tax incentives that are coming through the ethanol industry? Well, I think the first thing to do is you know go talk to your first point of sale, whether that's the cooperative or the grain elevator or the ethanol producer themselves and ask them how they're thinking about this, how they're going to make sure their fuel qualifies so they can help share some of that value. Because not everyone's going to be able to uh, qualify and, and some are going to be in a much better position. Carbon capture is a big piece of this. We talked about that life cycle model and how half of it's on farm and half of it's at the ethanol plant. Well, about 30 points of that carbon intensity of an average ethanol plant being about 60 Half of that is just from the biogenic CO2 that's coming off the fermenters, and today is, at most facilities, vented back into the atmosphere. If you can capture that, you're instantly in the money with this tax credit, and then all those farm production practices are also in the money. So a facility like that is going to be, I would say, much more aggressive in being willing to incentivize low carbon uh, practices on the farm. So it sounds to me like you really need to talk to your local ethanol facility uh, or your local grain buyer to find out, you know, is this going to be a possibility for your local geography? Absolutely. And, and look, since this, this law was passed back in August of 2022, we've all been scrambling to figure out just how we can play in this space, how we can make sure that uh, we're providing proper incentives to the farmers, um, as well as making sure we can get some value to continue to grow and expand uh, ourselves. So there's a lot of learning still going on. Not everyone may have this completely figured out. We certainly do not, uh, but we're anxiously looking for the next round of regulations to come out uh, to help chart us a, a more clear path forward, not only for surface transportation, but sustainable aviation fuel as well. Okay, Devin, so one thing that I took away today is that this tax incentive is only written into law for three years, right? And it's hard for a business owner, including a farmer, to make big changes based on a three-year policy. Sure. So in your professional opinion, I know nobody knows for sure, but in your professional opinion, do you think that tax law will be extended? The joke in Washington is that there's nothing more permanent than a temporary government program. <laughs> we saw this repeatedly with the biodiesel tax credit. While it sometimes lapsed, inevitably it got extended. And the beauty of this new technology neutral fuel credit is it brings together unusual political coalitions. You're suddenly going to have all of agriculture, the biorefining industry, as well as the oil guys all pulling for this because everyone's got a dog in this fight. Oh, and don't forget about the airlines. Sustainable aviation fuel is all rolled into this exact same credit. So the impetus to get this thing extended beyond the three-year runway, pardon the pun, is going to be very strong. In fact, there was an executive from Delta Airlines here today almost begging for more sustainable aviation fuel. I mean, yeah. they want it, it seems like to me. So. Yeah. I mean, Think about these publicly traded airlines. They've made commitments to their shareholders that they're going to decarbonize. 98% of their greenhouse gas footprint is from the fuel they burn. We are their only solution. They need farmers, they need biofuels, not the other way around. This is the opposite of the market conditions we've been facing for the past two decades. As we build out the ethanol industry, we've always had to fight to get into the gas tank. We've had to fight to, for higher blends to be offered. Now we're finally going to have a market pull where customers are truly demanding this new fuel. And the other important thing that I heard today on the same topic is, you know, don't look for there to be electric airplanes in the next 30, 40 years, right? We're a long way from that. So not only is the airline industry demanding sustainable aviation fuel, but they're demanding it for a long time to come, the way it looks to me. Absolutely. The, the physics just don't work for electric airplanes. It barely works for electric vehicles. Uh, but while there could be advances in hydrogen tech technology that ultimately make this obsolete, the process just of getting a new engine or a new oh, airplane yeah. right. approved, especially for commercial service, we're talking decades. Yeah. So yeah. This, this is something that we are a solution that can be available for them now. All right, Devin. So, you know, I completely recognize and you probably also completely recognize that you know, a lot of farmers have probably haven't heard about the 45Z tax credit yet, right? Mm -hmm. So this is all new, but you heard it here first. So, you know, part of this lead academy 
is to bring you cutting edge information and you know what you need to be thinking about two, three, four years down the road. Okay. So with all that said, what are the two or three key points that you think a farmer needs to know about this new tax credit? Sure. I think the number one thing is the future is bright. While it, it may seem scary to think about increasing input costs, cash rents going up, Brazil stealing our market share, electric vehicles taking out the biofuel sector, there is new opportunity here in sustainable aviation fuel. It's an almost unlimited market that we can tap into. The other big thing is this is a carrot, not a stick. You know, working in Washington for the past nine years, the number one thing I've pushed back on is government regulations of farming and agriculture. We finally have the opportunity to have a carrot out there where they're not telling us what to do. They're giving us the opportunity to go get it, go after these incentives, do the right things that in many cases you're already doing, and you can finally get, get compensated for it. I think those are the, the two big things. And then the third thing, look, there's always going to be uncertainty. Things will change. There will be changes to the model. But I would say, even if a new administration came in and attempted to roll all of this back, it's very unlikely, it's very hard to undo something like this. Think about other examples from the past, whether it's Obamacare or whatever else. Yeah. <laughs> once, once a government program is in place, it is sticky. Mm -hmm. So this is very likely going to be, it's going to be, might not look exactly like it is framed today, but it'll be very similar to that for the foreseeable future. All right, Devin, we really, truly appreciate your time sincerely. Thank you. Yes. And uh, thank you for watching our Lead Academy session. I hope this gives you some food for thought for the future, and we'll see you soon. Lead Academy. Liquor Grow. Excellence. In agronomy. Development.